Hey, everybody. Welcome back for season two of the Broken Banquet podcast. This season, we've got more interviews with missionaries around the world, more interviews with authors who have written amazing books about missions, and more conversations about what it means for us to abide with one another. And yes, probably a story or two about Ashley taking a walk, eating food, or having drinks with someone who she now loves. We're so glad you're back. We're glad to be back. And we hope that you will enjoy this episode. Hello, Ashley. Hello, Will Bailey. How are you? You know, I'm fine. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> this, we're, we're starting off with a bang. Um, we're starting off season two with apparently some of the same issues that we started off season one, which is just some technical difficulty. But we're getting through it. I feel like more and more God is telling us that we have this great podcast that we just need a solid podcast producer. Yeah. Um, An equipment manager. Right. And <laughs> hang on, because there's music playing in my ears. It's our, oh my gosh. <laughs> the introduction that's saved somewhere in my computer as you were talking just started playing in my ears. Like I was listening to an episode that was, um, Is it a good yeah. episode? Well, it was just the music. It was just the Irene and the sleepers, you know, the music, which we kind of need to hear at the beginning of an episode. So. Hey, we um, got a shout out from Irene and the sleepers on Facebook. Really? Yeah. Cool. I know. I bet their listenership has just skyrocketed since we co-opted <laughs> that song. I think it's called Bring You Home, something like that. Hey, check yes. it out, listeners. Irene and the Sleepers. The whole song's good, not just the eight seconds that we use for our intro. <laughs> well, so it's Ashley, good. would you like to introduce our guest? I would love to introduce our guest today. This is Stephanie Robinson. And she works with Faith to Action. And the reason why I know her at all whatsoever is because of one of our friends named Hunter Farrell. And Hunter Farrell was a guest on one of her podcasts or webinars, if you will, uh, with Bar Brian Fickert, who we're having on the podcast soon. But Stephanie uh, has a great story, and I'll let, why don't we just let her introduce herself? Because um, she and I have yet to go on a walk together or have a meal together or share a drink. So um, this will be the first opportunity for us to really hear about who she is. Yeah, Stephanie, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in order to transition from being just someone who Ashley knows to someone who Ashley loves, you have to either go on a walk with her, you have to share food with her, or you have to share drinks with her. So depending on how the next hour or so goes, you know, there may be an invitation from Ashley soon for you guys to do one of those three things. Oh gosh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure at all. It's yeah, been close enough to you to, to go for a walk with you, I think. Oh, well, that's great. Where do you live? I am in um, Southern Alabama. I'm in Fairhope, Alabama. So I don't no. think that's super far from you, aren't you in Louisiana? Yes, not at all. And we have a ton of people at my church who either go to Fairhope pretty regularly for vacation or folks that have moved there. So, well, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I'm with Faith to Action. I've been with them for just about two years. Actually came back with them uh, as soon as I moved back from Haiti. So I lived in Haiti for about 10 years prior. Where did you live in Haiti? I lived in a town called Maui. Okay. It's about an hour and a half north of Port-au-Prince. So just north on the road from, uh, let's see, Cabaret and then Arcaille and then Maui. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So if, you, if you've if you been to Haiti and you've had a beach day, you probably went to Alex the only beach. resort that's across the street from our community center. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So, okay. So there was an Episcopal church right on the road, right by Calico Beach. Yes. Um, and they have a water system that sits right up there with uh, solar power, solar power panels that are, that are on top of the building. And it's, it, it used to be like a retreat center right beside it. It was Episcopal retreat center. So I've spent a ton of time there. Well, that's great. So we, we moved back, um, 
kind of like unexpectedly, we, I came home for my brother's wedding in February of 2020. And then oh, um, yeah, we went back and forth a little bit, but that was basically it. So, <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Tell us more about time in Haiti. What was, what was that like? Um, well, it was life changing. I loved it. It was really hard. It was really eye opening. It was challenging to my faith. I think a lot of American people of faith, well, at least for me, I can't really speak for everybody, I guess, but for me, you know, your faith can take you only so far when you've only encountered a certain type of pe people. And Haiti just opened my eyes to a lot of different, different types of people and the way that they experience God and the things that we can all learn from them. So it was, it was really good. We started out in an orphanage and then, and I shared a little bit of this in the webinar, but we started out in our work in an orphanage and then started a organization that does family preservation work. My husband and I had just gotten married and we thought we wanted to go somewhere for a year. And we ended up going out to um, a YWAM base and we, it was in 2010. So it was right after the earthquake had happened in Haiti. And we were pretty certain we were not going to go there, but we really felt a strong pull from the Lord, probably the closest thing in my life to a call, like a real, I mean, it wasn't the audible voice of God or anything, but a real strong pull to go to Haiti. And we went and just fell in love with everything about it. So we stayed. Completely understand that. So you mentioned that you started in an orphanage and then transitioned into you said family preservation. Would you explain for folks who maybe haven't ever considered how the typical sort of stereotypical orphanage option that that comes to mind might not always be the most helpful way to address that kind of a situation? Yeah, I think the thing that I always start with is that more than 5 million children around the world right now live in orphanages, but 8 out of 10 of those children have at least one living parent, and many of those would be would want to care for those children if they felt that they could, mm -hmm. they were equipped to do so. Um, and then children who don't have parents usually do have an aunt or an uncle or a cousin who would take them in. And then we also, they also could potentially go into a local foster care system as well. So there really is almost no, there's just no need for an orphanage this day and age. And I think that's pretty difficult thing for people to understand because we've become accustomed to orphanages, meaning they don't have parents. Right. I myself worked at an orphanage for over two years and didn't even ask a single person, did these children have parents? It wasn't until one day I noticed that there were women coming in every Sunday to sit with the children. And I got confused. And so I asked somebody at the orphanage, hey, who are these women? What are they doing here? And they said, oh, these are the mothers of the children, just so quickly, as if that was something I was supposed to know. And I, my whole worldview kind of changed in that moment because I had, in my mind, given up so much to help the orphans. And these children not only had parents that, that were alive, but they had parents who really cared for them, cared enough to make, you know, a two hour walk one way just to see their child for the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And so I started wondering if a child is loved that much by their parent, what must that parent face what kind of options must that parent not feel like they have in order to put their child in an orphanage in the first place? Mm -hmm. So that's why we started moving towards family-based care, which is putting kids in families. And this was something new for me too, Stephanie, that it just completely blew my mind that of all of these kids that were in orphanage after orphanage to find out that most of these kids were what they referred to as economic orphans, were just it was it just completely blew my mind I don't have a better phrase for that but it just completely blew my mind and then to ask the question of why why is this a thing and what are some of the answers I would be interested to hear what are some of the answers that you found yeah 
I, it, in my time in Haiti, I thought, well, this is economic. This is purely economic. So we went on to start a family preservation organization with a handful of our Haitian friends who our primary goal was providing things like wraparound services for children, providing some employment for parents, that kind of thing. But since I've started with Faith to Action, I've learned more of the terminology for those things, and we call them push and pull factors. And I just think about all the orphanages that I saw go up in Haiti. And these push and pull factors, you know, you imagine that you're a parent who's struggling to feed their child one meal a day, and then you see this building go up in record time, and you hear that this place would have education for your child. You hear that this place would have food for your child, medical care. They would be exposed to good opportunities. You hear all of these things. And sometimes your child's even recruited for, from a place like this. And all of those things are pulling this person into the orphanage. They're pulling, the allure is pulling them in. And at the same time, Haiti has had a, a real season of intense violence, basically like a civil war. They've had illness. And then personal families, you know, they can have anything from an illness in the family to a death in the family. And all of those things really push that person to consider it in the first place. So I, I think that there are a lot of things. Poverty is the number one reason, but there are so many other things that play into that as well that I didn't necessarily think about when I was working in an orphanage in Haiti. I just thought I was doing the right thing. I completely agree. That was that was what we kept seeing everywhere is that because the because you have to pay for school in Haiti, even the the smaller schools or the government type schools, you have to pay for your child to go. And uh, so tuition, a uniform, books, all those things. I can't afford that. So I'm going to send my child to live at this orphanage and have someone else raise my child just so that they can get an education where I can only feed them once a day. And over here, they're going to get two meals a day. Medical care, I can't afford for my my child to even go to the doctor when they have a cold. But if there's a medical team coming in once a week over here, I can send them there. And I and I kept wondering what what the different models could be to because a family's important. It's just so important when you're living at a we st I started calling them children's homes, maybe instead of orphanages, just to try to change my mindset of what that looked like. And in some cases, maybe like a boarding school or something. But but what what could we do to help a family realize that the family unit is the most important thing for the child versus sending them here? So what have you found? I'm curious to know how that next step started happening. Well, for us personally, we failed at trying to track down some parents first. <laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, we were very naive and, and didn't realize what we know now, which is that organizations like Faith to Action are there to help make transitions happen for orphanages if everybody is on board. Um, and I could talk more about that later if you want. But for us, once we started hearing the stories from the parents that would come in, so, you know, I would sit down and talk to them and hear about where they're from and what they thought the orphanage was doing for their child. It just occurred to us that our place was maybe stopping this problem before it started. Just trying to say, hey, parents, we're with you. I mean, we have so many social services here and things for people to lean into if they need a little bit of help. And in Haiti, there's not there's not necessarily that safety net. There's not somebody saying, is your child eating every day? Are you feeling overwhelmed? You know? And so just the, sounds so kind of corny, but the ministry of presence and just being there with, with people, with parents um, and saying, you know, you're not alone. What is it that you need? If kids need to go to the hospital, if kids need to go um, to school, how can we partner with that? And I can say personally, after raising money for an orphanage to help 30 kids versus now raising money for over 300 kids to stay with their families, it is so much cheaper to help the families and not run an orphanage. Like it's so, so, so much more. Not only does it make more sense in every other way, but it also economically makes a lot more sense. Will you, will you talk for a second? Because that's, well, first of all, you said ministry of presence and that's our love language. So thank you for using that phrase. <laughs> 
what are some of the specific programs that you do that you promote as an alternative that actually helps the family? And obviously, you're not just throwing money at them. Um, sure. So what are the kinds of things that you're doing that allows the family unit to actually stay together in spite of all these challenges, whether it is civil war or you know extreme poverty or, or all this instability? Um, how are you able to equip these families, the parents, so that they can stay together as a family? I think, and you live on the ground, so like on the field, so you might know what I'm talking about, but I think First of all, every organization needs to realize we're all in this together. We're all trying to empower families and keep families together. There's a really great network that just started called the Haiti Family Care Network, and it's five different organizations, and they're also doing this kind of work. And I personally think all of us, yeah, all of us need to be working together to, to keep families together. And that being said, our, our priorities were listening to the community. When we first kind of made that transition out of the orphanage, we said, what is it that you feel like are, are big stumbling blocks when you're trying to think about raising your child? And it was pretty overwhelming, but the big, the big things were, as Ashley already mentioned, education, food, and also a sense of autonomy, which was the most interesting thing to us. Um, people really want to feel like they're in charge of their destiny, that, that God has a plan for them. God has a plan for their family. And so it was really important for us to provide families with options for how they wanted to support their children. So we have a couple of different business initiatives. There are parents that sew. There are parents that work in our little farm. We also do a lot of clean water and sanitation, which... Children are usually responsible for collecting water in other countries, especially in Haiti. And by placing those at a school, now this child feels like they can go to school. We help with school fees, school clothes, because it is very expensive. I mean, for a country that lives on basically $2 a day, it's about $500 for the year to go to school. So it's just, I mean, you can never get ahead. I had a friend in Haiti who... Uh, was a single mom and she had two children and she would just every year sell a piece of furniture to try and get her children into school. And she's trying her best. She tried everything she could. And then one day she ran out of furniture and she brought us into her house and she was like, I really don't have anything else to sell. We were like, well, let's see what we can do. So she works with us now in our sewing co-op, but she, but she also does receive a lot of parental training, support. We do Bible studies. Everything is based around community, but there also is, of course, a financial um, assistance program as well to help children go to school, to help to help them be fed in school. How different is the the model for the programming that your organization uses in the different places? I looked at your website, and there's a map with pins all over the planet. So uh, obviously. Haiti is Haiti, and I'm not sure how unique the way that you address issues in Haiti, how different is that from the way that you address issues in any of the other countries that you are involved? I saw that you, you're you involved with uh, Roble Alto, which is a, a very well-known program here in Costa Rica, but I'm, I also know that the situation in Costa Rica is much different than it is in Haiti. Is it still that same kind of, of programming or is each country completely different the way that you approach trying to keep these families intact? I think every child is probably pretty different, every situation. And there are certain countries that are just recovering from things like dictatorship and mass civil war, something like that. So they might have more orphanages and the government might be making steps to try and um, get those children into homes. There's also definitely there's a lot of cool stuff happening in Latin America right now, thanks to the work of organizations like Robliato and also Casa Viva, where they are basically training people in the church to become foster parents um, and working alongside the government as well. There's a lot of different options for the way that we care for children around the world, but the the main thing is still 
eight out of 10 of these kids across the, across the planet have parents. And so sometimes the government's a little bit more bought in. And I think it's definitely changing in that direction. It's definitely going in that direction, but sometimes it's not. And either way, there are people on the ground that are making a big difference. It's a growing number of organizations around the world who are partnering with local and national governments to advocate for family care policies at the governmental level and then in- implement foster care and adoption programs and domestically and to help orphanages overall just transition to family care models. And we're really excited because more and more Christians are also joining this movement. A lot of people, a lot of churches and Christian faith-based nonprofits have started orphanages. So I know that's a hard transition for them to make, but they are, a lot of people are starting to join in and, and try to move that needle a little bit. I have one more question and then I know Ashley wants to jump in. I'm, I'm sure that one of the kind of the draws for the orphanage, the normal orphanage model um, and I was going to say for better or for worse, but there's really no better part to this. It's for worse is if I'm supporting an orphanage or I'm sponsoring a kid, then I can go, I can go and visit and you know, we can play together for a week and that feels really good. And I can see how healthy and happy they are. When you transition away from that model, how do you keep partners? What does partnership look like when you've moved away from that? If I'm interested in your organization, but I've, you know, for the last 20 years had this experience of going to visit. How do you communicate to me how I'm still going to be connected to people who are benefiting from this ministry, but just in different ways? Man, you are hitting uh, a nerve for, for a lot of people who are curious about this. You're deaf. I mean, a huge issue for, for somebody. And even for us, when we were transitioning from working with this orphanage and raising money for this orphanage to moving towards a more family-based care model is very (laughs) nerve-wracking because you don't want to lose funds. You don't want to lose the support of people. You don't want to lose the prayers and interactions that people have with your ministry. You don't. And I would say it is challenging because you, we really don't support children, especially in institutions being visited by outsiders and then abandoned. (laughs) So what do we do with that? I think education is a big piece of that. And that is, can be scary for organizations that are making that shift. But for me, I was able to sit down with people and say, when we visit an orphanage for a week, we are re-traumatizing these children who have already been abandoned by their parents for various reasons. We are stigmatizing them as orphans. We're making them play this part without them even knowing, and you know, they're six, seven years old. On top of all of that, an orphanage separates a child, not only from their family, but from their community. You know, most orphanages you guys have probably visited for me as well, you know, they have these big walls. And when they age out, these children are at severe risk for all kinds of things, trafficking, suicide. It's not good for them. It's not good for anybody to be separated from their family and community. So to me, education is that first piece. And then you move into, here are the benefits of supporting a family. I will say people do like to hear that it's more cost effective <laughs> to support a family. But even for us and our little ministry in Haiti, we, we had people come and work alongside of our Haitian staff for something like a family day or a parenting class or doing models that would empower and educate parents and families about different topics. And it wasn't just them doing it. They were working alongside of our Haitian staff. And we got really good feedback from that, to be honest. It worked really well. I think people people do want to be helpful on their short-term trips. They do want to make a difference. I definitely think talking people through, talking somebody who has visited an orphanage for a long time, talking them through the different options that they have moving forward is a, is a big piece of that. And we've had a lot of success with that, to be honest. And I know a lot of other organizations have as well. So I want to ask a question that may be a, may be a bad question to ask, but I am very curious to see what your response is. Being a director of an orphanage in Haiti is very lucrative because you get this money and prestige in your community and 
you usually have a Western Anglo church that's supporting you and that gives you more credibility and prestige in your community. And now I get to drive a car and have a house and have all this respect. So I'm curious to know what the indigenous population, how their reaction has been to this transition from an orphanage model to a family preservation model? I think that, of course, there are people who want to take advantage of the system anywhere. Yes. But I think the idea of an orphanage is often very foreign to people. It's kind of imported from the United States and from other places like that. And that's why people sometimes even misunderstand what it is. A lot of places like Haiti, a lot of African cultures, I'm sure a lot of Asian cultures, they have kind of built in foster care systems. Mm -hmm. We take that away when we we put these orphanages in and they're like, oh, okay, okay. So a lot of indigenous people that I know, a lot of Haitians that I know, they are, it's much more in line with their culture and their values to simply support families because it's very common for community members to take care of somebody down the street whose parents are out of town or somebody who's out of uh, down the street whose mom doesn't have food like they're constantly bringing each other food sharing resources so i think the orphanage model actually is very countercultural to a lot of cultures like haiti personally yeah that's awesome that's good news i was just yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering sitting here thinking about some of the experiences I've had and I'm wondering going into those situations and meeting with those leaders how that how that would have gone how that conversation would have gone and I do think a lot of people are resistant to that because the culture of aid has been so beaten to the heads of people in Haiti and other places it's like no this is the way we do it but when you get down to why is this the way we do it often the reason is because well that's what that's what somebody from another culture told me to do. That's where some, what somebody from the U.S. told me to do. This is the way we care for children in orphanages. Well, it just seems so typical of how often these ideas of the best way to fix a problem have been imported by outsiders and kind of imposed on the community because there, was, there wasn't enough time taken to just be in the community and listen to the community and let the community have a say. And so they're sort of forced into adopting these models that are countercultural, that are completely foreign from them. And it's because of this sort of superiority, this kind of mentality that we have the answers and we're going to go tell people how to do things better. And lo and behold, over time, when people actually are in the community and listening to the community, there are other solutions that aren't countercultural. They're actually really natural for the community to respond to those kinds of, of opportunities that, like you say, wind up being more cost effective, better for the families, better for the communities. And it, but it all started with a lack of abiding is a word that we use a lot on this podcast. But abiding takes time, it takes patience, it takes humility, it takes commitment, it takes a whole lot of things that when we just, you know, we're revved up and ready to go save the world, we don't take the time to do that stuff. And I do want to ask, because I'm afraid that there may be some people listening who, okay, so if eight out of every 10 children that are in an orphanage have parents, that means there's two out of those 10 who don't. So are there situations where actually the best, safest, healthiest option for these children is a facility, a ministry, whatever you want to call it, where they are housed and fed and cared for, and that is the family for them? Surely there are some places in the world where because of the situation, and there is no family to preserve. So this is a crisis and the best option is to bring these children into a place where they will be safe and cared for. I mean, is that, is that true or is it actually, is that just me trying to, to make excuses and save something that, that we think is good just so that we don't feel so badly about things that we've done, you know, for so long. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I think 
especially when I started this job with Faith to Action, that was sort of in the back of my mind. I was like, okay, but sometimes, sometimes, and it's true. Sometimes it is the best option. It's usually short term while maybe family tracing is done. And it's usually, we find that it's usually um, older children. So like maybe a street kid, it's difficult, difficult to track down their parents. So the best option for that child immediately to get them off the streets is to put them in a facility. But then hopefully you have a social worker, a national social worker, tracking down a family member who would be interested in taking care of this child. And so that's usually what we use um, a, chi- a children's home orphanage for, is that kind of in-between situation where a family is being tracked down. Because 8 out of 10 of these kids have parents, but 10 out of 10 of these orphans uh, around the world usually have a family member who would want to take care of them. So even if both of their parents have passed away, they still usually have an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, neighbor who would take care of them. I wonder now, because I, so Stephanie, I am a, like a global mission pastor at a local church, right? So what would it look like for First Methodist Church to be in partnership with Faith in Action uh, what would that partnership look like generally and then specifically? That's, that's part of my job. That's what I love to do. I get to talk to missions pastors a lot who are saying, listen, we've been working in this community in Mexico for a long time. People want to go because they can hold babies. Mm-hmm. What can I do that's still going to engage my church, but that's also good for the development of these children, not going to cause any emotional harm? <laughs> So, Stephanie, my name is Ashley, and I'm from First Methodist Church in Shreveport, Louisiana, and we have been supporting an orphanage in Lakai, Haiti called Derivage for over 10 years now. I love the pastor and his wife. They've been here to Shreveport many times. I can give you the name and birth date of every single child that lives at Derivage. I love them like they were my own children, but I do see that this model is not working. What can I do with Faith in Action? Well, we have, what I love about Faith to Action is everything is free. And I know, especially for churches and and other ministries, that, that can be a barrier to entry. So Faith to Action does not want to stop, let, let finances or anything else be a barrier to entry for this kind of transition. I commend you for wanting to potentially <laughs> uh, change your model. It's very difficult. Um so I usually would ha- would talk with you about the different ways that you guys have supported over the years, what that looks like. And then Faith to Action, actually, I can email you about this later, but we have a transition event and it's for three days and we get people who are in very similar situations to you. We get people who are in very, who have walked through very similar paths who were supporting an orphanage and then made that shift to family-based care, sit down with you. They'll sit down with, I mean, if your pastor has a uh, way to get to the States, they would sit down with him as well. Like we would love for him to come too. And then come up with a plan how to make this, because I think talking about transition is like fine and well, but then when you're on the ground, there are a lot of moving parts and we have to make sure that it's done in a way that's really excellent and no children are going to be like traumatized further. No children are going to get lost in the mix. And so the hope of this transition event is to sit down and have a real conversation about what it looks like. And then to follow up, do a lot of follow-up calls, connect you with people that are on the ground that are doing this work. So you just don't feel alone. It's kind of that ministry residence again that we're talking about. But yeah, I mean, I love talking to, especially with Haiti, I love talking to people who are like, oh, maybe we want to shift our shift our focus a little bit because that was totally me. And there's no shame in that, right? Like we're doing the best that we can. I think it's really important to remove any kind of feelings of like guilt and shame because we really are just doing the best that we can. And when we know better, we do better. And so when we know a little bit better, we can start asking the questions, okay, what would it look like to still have relationships with these kids, but with their families as well? And the the answers are are there, and I um, that's super exciting that you're considering transitioning. We would love to help you with that. 
for sure. Thanks, Stephanie. We'll have a follow-up meeting. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'd like to uh, move in a different direction. If that's all right. You mentioned that you lived in Haiti for 10 years. Then you came back to the States in, did you say 2020? Yes. And stayed. <laughs> so that means you you transitioned from life in the mission field in a, a very intense place with a lot going on into life in the United States in a pandemic. And now you're still you're still there. Can you talk a little bit, if you don't mind, just kind of personally, what what was that like for you? I'd be curious to hear a little bit about your your process. I think it's sweet. You called it a process. <laughs> it was really, really hard. Uh, one of the most terrible things. I think a couple of things. When you go, when you have this like pull to the mission field, there's this sense of call and purpose. And I always envisioned that when I was coming off of the field, if I ever was to to move from Haiti, that I would really know it. I would feel it in my mm-hmm. bones. I would be like, this is exactly what I should be doing. And that just was not the case. We came back. Half of our stuff is still in Haiti. Like we, my husband and I will talk and we'll be like, no, no, there's something in the closet. I can see it in my mind's eye. And then it'll take probably like 10 minutes for us to say, no, that's actually in Haiti. It's in our closet in Haiti. <laughs> Haven't seen that piece of clothing in two and a half years. So it definitely was really hard. And I live in a small town and it was a very lonely when I came back because I had, I mean, we lived with people like we lived with Haitians for about eight of those 10 years. And it, we didn't like seek that out. It just sort of happened. And I'm so, I'm so thankful that it did happen like that. I think that's what created the trust to keep like the ministry going, even though we're here and they're there. But I encountered God in a very different way. And I'm sure you both know what I'm talking about. But when we see the, the Lord from a very specific place coming from our Western ideals of individualism and capitalism and it just all of those different isms that we see, we're only seeing like one side of God. And when you live and work with some of, you know, the world's most materially poor, you see God in a, to- in a totally different way. I did. And truth be told, that's probably the, is definitely the reason why I'm still a Christian is because of their witness to me and their willingness to share with me how God met them in very specific dark places in their life, lives and how I just was able to be a witness to it, to be honest, like just the daily struggles of people in Haiti and how God dwells among the the, the people who are brokenhearted and who are poor. And I think we in the States have a responsibility to respond to that, right? We we have a responsibility to say, okay, you're a brother, you're a sister, like let's let's help each other. Mm-hmm. So that that whole the really it was a theological shift kind of was difficult for me to come back. There was a lot of disconnect and I probably didn't do it like super well either, to be honest, because I just also had a lot of trauma. <laughs> But I, we still are surprised that we live here, right? It's still kind of like, oh, okay. Thank you for for sharing that. Haiti's in the news, um, you know, pretty pretty regularly, unfortunately, for not, you know, great reasons. If you, I don't know if you ever, if you hear people talking about Haiti or just when you see something news about it, what's the one thing that you sort of wish you could grab people by the shoulders and go, oh, wait. And kind of set the record straight, or or is there like, do you have some sort of a reaction? Do you because you were there for so long, living with Haitians in in their communities? I mean, is there something that you feel like you've seen that obviously we don't see? I would say the biggest thing that people say to me is, "We donated all of this money to Haiti." Dot dot dot. You know where. How come they can't account for it? How come this? How come that? I, my biggest thing is you did not donate that money to Haiti. You donated it to the American Red Cross, to an American bank account, or you donated this to a 
nonprofit that's doing the best they can, like when you donate money to any country, <laughs> you know, you, we all need to be informed donors and informed givers. So when you give to something and, and what has happened specifically with the American Red Cross in Haiti is really terrible, but this is what you're giving to. It's, it's organizations and you guys obviously both know that, but I think sometimes there's a disconnect like, well, I texted this number because we make giving so easy. We make giving so accessible. But you didn't text Haiti. You texted, you know, you linked your bank account with the American Red Cross. And so I would say that there are brilliant, innovative, creative, amazing, wonderful humans in Haiti that are working tirelessly for their communities. They are not looking for a way out, even during the this worst season of their lives like a lot of my friends are in their 30s and they've never seen anything really like this before and they're there and they're making a difference and they're serving their communities and they're loving their neighbors and you know those are the stories that we don't hear so often but i get the privilege of hearing that and it's so awesome and i know it's around the world you know in conflict zones and other places people are stepping up so yeah, thank you for asking that question. Well, and that's those are the truths that we learn through abiding. Again, it's because of the way that you've invested time and energy and yourself with your brothers and sisters there that you have that kind of communication and that kind of relationship where they share those things that I'm not going to get because I haven't abided with them. Um, and I think you're right. There's stories like that from... Afghanistan and Sudan and Somalia and everywhere around the world that things are, are what we hear about just these snippets. It's the worst of the worst and whatever's going to grab people's attention. But when we really commit to building relationships with actual people in actual places, then we get to see the glorious stuff that, that you're talking about. Yeah. And like you said, it's long stuff, you know, it's, it's commitment, it's long suffering work. So that's the, the flip side to all that, that I'm sure you see regularly as well. Will you ever go back to Haiti? Oh, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so for sure. <laughs> as soon as we can. <laughs> well, thank you for, for being with us today. Thank you for the work that you're doing. It's, it's wonderful for Ashley and I to be able to point people in good directions. It's something that, that we're really working very hard at. You know, Ashley's in a local church in Louisiana and I'm here in, in Costa Rica, but our gaze goes you know much broader than that. And we're really trying to get people to rethink the way they approach their, their mission relationships. And we're excited to come across you all and to hear more about what you all are doing. So thank you for sharing with us and uh, for being on the Broken Banquet podcast. Thanks so much for having us, for me. <laughs> Thanks for all the back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and trading times and all of that. Really good. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. See ya. Bye, Will. Bye, Ashley. Thanks, Stephanie. See y'all later. <laughs> Bye. You've been listening to The Broken Banquet, a podcast by Will Bailey and Ashley Goad. Music provided by Irene and the Sleepers. Join us next week for another episode. He's prepared the table. All things are ready. Come to the feast.